Hi everyone and welcome from Clarinet Cyber Security to today's presentation on the OSP Top 10 series. Today we will be looking specifically at A7 cross-site scripting. Just a little introduction on myself. I'm a penetration tester for Sec1 and I've been working in RT for the last 10 years now, mainly coming from a development background. I'm also an offensive security certified professional and CREST registered tester. On the agenda for today, we will look at what is cross-site scripting, how we can identify it, and also how we can prevent it. Here we can see a full list of the OSP top 10 and all the topics that we will be covering throughout this exciting series. So do please stay tuned in. Right, let's jump into the one we are covering today, A7, cross-site scripting. There are three main types of cross-site scripting, reflected, stored, and DOM and I will get into some examples of each a little bit later. So how does stored cross-site scripting occur? Well, it occurs when untrusted data is sent to the interpreter by a malicious user as part of a command or query. This can be through form input fields, by the URL, or various other ways. The interpreter then executes these unintended commands, leading to unintended code execution. So how do we identify cross-site scripting vulnerabilities? Well, we can make use of automated tools. These tools send automatic payloads to input parameters. One example of such a tool is XSSO. This tool comes bundled with the Kali Linux penetration testing distro. We can also manually call the web application and enter payloads ourselves. This allows for more granularity than automated tools. Lastly, looking to the source code is a great option if that's available or open source. We can look for any user supplied data that does not look to be sanitized or filtered. Let's take a look now at the first category of cross-site scripting, reflected cross-site scripting. This is where unsanitized input, either from input fields, by the URL, or other means, is reflected back to the user in the HTTP response. We will come to an example of this shortly. With reflected XSS, the injected input is not stored within the application permanently. What this means is that attackers will likely use social engineering tactics to entice you to click on malicious links usually sent by email or hosted on public forums. Let's take a look at an example of reflected XSS now. So here we can see that an insecure web application is taking a search parameter as input from the user. And we can see that the input is then being reflected back in the response. So what happens when a malicious user passes an executable code as input? Well, we can see that the code then gets inserted into the web page and gets executed by the browser. This code could be used to steal a user's session token, allowing the attacker to gain access to the user's account or to deface the web application's response. Let's see a live example of this in action now. In this live example of reflected XSS, we can see the vulnerable web application takes input from the user. Let's see this. So here we can see the input is reflected back in the application. So what happens if we input executable code? Again, we can see the executable code is reflected back in the response and executed by the browser. Next, we come to the more dangerous form of cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting. This is the most dangerous type of cross-site scripting because the unsanitized executable code is stored permanently by the application, affecting many more users. All the user has to do is visit their favorite site and they will likely be affected. Unlike our previous example where the user would have to be enticed to click on a malicious link, here the attacker does not usually need to send out any links at all. Let's take a look at an example of stored cross-site scripting. Here we can see a vulnerable web application that stores user comments on posts. In the first post, we can see a regular user posting a harmless comment that gets stored on the server. Then if we look through an attacker's eyes, we can see that a malicious attacker is sending in some executable code as a comment. Here in this case, the code looks to be sending the victim's cookie information to the attacker. This will allow the attacker to most likely gain access to the user's account and perform actions as their user. 
Let's see a lab example of this in action. Here we can see the vulnerable application allows users to sign a guest book. You can also see the comments are stored on the server. Let's add a comment now. So here we can see the comment is now stored. But what happens again if we input executable code? Here we can see the code is executed by the browser once again. But this time, let's see what happens when we refresh the page. Again, we can see the vulnerability is still there. So any user that visits this page, the code will execute. The third category of XSS is called DOM-based cross-site scripting. The document object model, or DOM, is just a model of your web page that you can interact with using JavaScript. DOM-based XSS is a client-side injection issue. What this means is that the input does not get processed by the server like stored or reflected XSS. So any server-side filtration or sanitization will not have any effect. Again, social engineering is usually required to entice a user to click on a malicious link. Here we can see an example of DOM-based XSS. We can see that the insecure site is writing out the URL of the page into the HTML document. Now, if we take a look lower down, we can see the attacker is sending in a hash bang URL with some executable code added on. Anything after a hash bang URL is never sent to the server. They are usually used by JavaScript libraries for state changing abilities. So the executable code is never sent to the server where any server side filtration or validation takes place and instead written directly into the DOM. Let's see this type of XSS in action. So here the vulnerable application is writing out the URL into the page. With DOM-based XSS, nothing is sent to the server, so no server-side validation takes place. Let's take a look. So if we refresh the page, we can see the input from the URL is written into the page. So again, what happens if we send an executable code? Let's see. And when we refresh the page, we can see the XSS gets executed again by the browser. Time for a famous XSS case study, the famous Sammy Worm. This was a really interesting worm back in the day of MySpace. It was an XSS worm designed to spread across MySpace. When a user visited Sammy's profile, they would add the XSS code into the victim's profile page. And then when a user visited that victim's profile page, the process would just keep repeating itself. It managed to infect over 1 million users within just 20 hours. And it displayed the string, but most of all, Sammy is my hero, on each victim's profile page. So how do we prevent and remediate XSS? Well, we need to escape before the output of untrusted data. There are different types of escaping that should be done in the correct context. For example, HTML escaping should be done when input has been placed into the body of the HTML document, such as div tags. But HTML escaping won't work if you're putting untrusted data into a script tag. This is where JavaScript escaping should be used. CSS escaping, again, should be used when placing untrusted data into the CSS style property values. And again, URL escaping should be used when placing data into URLs. Implement the content security policy. This is a great browser side mechanism that allows you to create whitelists for client side resources like JavaScript and CSS. It's a great policy and helps a lot with the prevention of the XSS. The script source self specifies that loading of scripts is only allowed from your web application. The connect source self again only allows connections to your web application. For example, when using the XML HTTP request. Validation is important. If you're expecting a number, make sure you get a number. Comparing inputs to a whitelist of allowed values helps a lot as well. The web application firewall is another great defense as it looks to filter and block XSS attacks. 
On a final note, I thought I would mention the XSS protection header. This is a feature of Internet Explorer, Chrome, and Safari that stops pages from loading when it detects XSS. This has now been deprecated. It is now recommended to just disable the header and rather rely on the content security policy, as there have been several issues with it that could lead to vulnerabilities. Finally, I just wanted to list some resources that you may find helpful in the fight against cross-site scripting. That's all from me and the Clarinet Cybersecurity team. I hope you all enjoyed this short introduction to XSS. Goodbye for now, take care, and thank you. Thank you.